Hey everybody, how you doing? This is Graham. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. Just checking to see where everybody is coming from tonight. Um, just having a look at the participant list. We've got people from Budapest, Hungary. Hello, Hungary. Hong Kong. Hello, Hong Kong. Tokyo, Japan. Konbanwa. Who else have we got? Indonesia, Jakarta. Uh, where else do we have people coming from tonight? We've got somebody from Shanghai tonight. Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City. Good evening to everybody. Great to see you all. Excellent. Thank you. Just pop in the chat box at the bottom. Let me know where you're from, just so we can know where everybody's from here tonight. It'd be great to find out so I can get an idea of where the audience is here tonight. So thank you for joining me this evening. I know you are all busy people and you could be watching TV tonight, but instead you're here with me. So it's great that you're here with me. Um, I really appreciate that. What we're going to do in the next 40 minutes is talk about how to build a business the location independent way. So let's talk about what that is. Just so you can get used to the format this evening. You may have not been part of one of these webinars before. There's a chat box down there at the bottom. Um, what happens is, is that's where you can interact with me. That's where you can ask questions. If there's any problems, just put something in the chat box. If you have any questions during this presentation, just put it in the chat box. Let me know where you're from as you join as well. Um, the format tonight, we're going to talk about how to build a location independent business. Now, you can do this, build a business and travel the world if you want to, or you can decide not to travel. But the point about a location independent business is you don't have to be based anywhere. So this is all about building a lean business that gives you choice. Tonight is all about choice. So what I'm going to do tonight is talk about what the problem is that entrepreneurs have when growing businesses, particularly for entrepreneurs growing fast growth businesses. There's a very, uh, there's a common set of problems that they face. I want to talk about those and how you can avoid them. Talk about the solution, how you can build a business that you can take anywhere with you in the world. So you can travel, you can live and work anywhere in the world, or you can just decide that you might want to take some time off. You know, take, take an adventure somewhere for a couple of weeks, you can do that kind of thing. So you're not committed to the business all the time. You're not a slave to the business. This is all about choice, building a business that you control, not a business that controls you. And then we we'll finish off by talking about what's coming up next week, which is an extension of this theme about growing your business, and then a Q&A session. So if you have any questions during this presentation, as I said, put your questions in the chat box. I'll do my best to answer these at the end. There you go. Just so you know where the chat box is, it's down there, guys. So feel free. So let's talk about patient independent businesses because in recent years there's been a lot written about these kind of businesses. You may or may not be familiar with these pieces of uh, not fiction that are produced, such as The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. I recommend all of the books I'm going to show you in the next minute. Um, you don't have to take furious notes tonight. This is going to go quite fast. At the end, I'm going to give you a link or I'm going to give you some details where you can get this presentation so you don't have to write in pages and pages of notes. You can concentrate on interacting with me and listening to what I've got to say. So don't worry about what I'm going to show you now. Just take it in and at the end, you can get access to all this information. So the four hour work week was probably one of the first books that set the theme about how to build a business and live anywhere in the world. Obviously, this is the main book that a lot of people have copied as well, but there have been other works as well, like Vagabonding by Rolf Potts, which is about, you know, permanent travel, you know, going traveling around the world on your own terms. Then there are books on the business side, like the Startup Owner's Manual by Steve Blank and Bob Dorf, which was really the book which defined the startup movement of the last 10 years, which is all about lean startups, you know, how to build a business with minimum overheads and you know how to build things like minimum viable products stuff that we talked about in the other webinars as well um, anything you want by Derek Sivers I thoroughly recommend this book this is a book about how to grow a business on your terms Derek Sivers one of the first people to build an e-commerce website in the world we're talking about 1995 you know pre Netscape Navigator days he sold the business CD Baby $25 million. He talks about how to grow a business on your terms, not growing a business because you need to grow a business, growing a business because you want to grow a business. And I talk about that tonight, about how to grow a business on your terms and avoid some of the mistakes that Derek Sivers talks about in his book. 
The Seven Day Startup, I thoroughly recommend this book by Dan Norris. This is how to launch a business in seven days. Basically, if you're taking longer than seven days to launch your business, you're taking too long. That's the theory behind the seven day startup. I thoroughly recommend this book. We're actually going to talk about this book next week in the webinar. So if you're interested in how to do that, you know, this isn't just about launching fast, but keeping it lean and launching with the minimum amount of money and budget. This is about building a business, launching fast and learning. If you want to learn more about that, then come along next week because I'm going to do a webinar just about this book and this theme. So the goal of tonight is all about location independence. So what exactly is that about? Well, we're going to talk about how to build a lean location independent business. And ultimately, that's about choice. Because if you build a lean business, then it means you can do many things with that business that you can't do with the opposite, which is what I would call a fat business, which is a business with heavy overheads, too many staff. You're doing the kind of work that you don't want to be doing. If you keep it lean, you can make things a lot easier for yourself. You can get a lot more choice in growing your business. You can take, couldn't take if you had a fat business. Like, for example, where to position the business, the kind of work you want to do, the kind of products that you want to create. That's all about keeping it lean and location independent. So my story is that four years ago now, I decided that I wanted to travel the world with my family. And I had a location independent business. For 12 years, we built a telecoms research business. And it got it to such a stage that I could walk away from that business at any stage. You know, I had people running the business. I could go and travel the world. I could do what I wanted to. And that's really what it's about. This is why we become entrepreneurs, do this kind of thing to create a better lifestyle for ourselves, right? Not to grow a business, ultimately. The growing the business is the means, the end is having choice in your lifestyle. So this is what I did. And for three years, we traveled the world. We went all over the place, you know, places like Fiji, uh, New Zealand, California, Florida, Cyprus, Fuerteventura, Canary Islands off Africa, Okinawa, as pictured here. Three years, we traveled the world permanently. And at the same time, I was running my business from anywhere in the world. I was in a tropical island. As long as I had internet connection, I could run that business. I could decide to stay in Tokyo or London and run that business. And that would be great. That's the point. You can do that too. But then you have choice. You have choice to go wherever you want at any time. You're not trapped in a business. So as long as you can get internet connection and you can get internet connection anywhere most days, even in you know a bamboo beach hut in Fiji, you can get a four or five meg internet connection in your business from there. You can work anywhere in the world because if you have a laptop, you're a factory. That's how it is today. And this is me working, honestly. Well, not always working. I mean, I get bored lying on a beach, to be honest, all the time. I actually like working. I prefer working to lying on a beach. So it makes sense that, you know, even if you enjoy these tropical environments, that you have access to the tools to work. Because as an entrepreneur, I feel if you're not being creative, then it drives you crazy, right? So the three things that you'll get today from this webinar, if you stick around the end, the first one is the lean strategy, then the key mistakes that entrepreneurs make when growing a business, and then talk about that seven-day startup next week's webinar, which you can join. So let's have a look at the mistakes first, the key mistakes that entrepreneurs make when growing their business. The first one of these is they stick as a freelancer. So often entrepreneurs start as a freelancer. So they're doing work for somebody else, they're doing project work and so on. And they never progress from being a freelancer to being a fully blown business owner. And this is the big mistake because as a freelancer, you only have maybe 16 hours in a day to work. So you can never maximize that. So the key to being successful and having choices to create assets within your business. So I'll talk about how you can do that tonight. The second mistake, and this is what most entrepreneurs do, and I see this because I mentor businesses, I work with entrepreneurs, I invest in startups. The biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make is not understanding the difference between good and bad growth. Let me say that again, not understanding the difference between good and bad growth. 
Most entrepreneurs start business thinking that growth is growth is growth, which is not true. There's a difference. There's some types of growth which are good for you and some types of growth which are bad for you. And what about those and what they are? The problem is that most entrepreneurs chase all kinds of growth, so they get a good bit of growth and a bad bit of growth. And what happens is, is they end up with business which traps them. So a question for you tonight, if you left your business and traveled the world for six months and you came back, what situation would your business be in if you didn't work for six months? If you say to me that you're, you would no longer have a business, right? then you don't have a business, you have a job. That's the fact. A lot of entrepreneurs think they have a business when they don't just have a, a job which they happen to control a little bit more than if they work for somebody else. That's the difference between working in your business and working on your business. So let's talk about good and bad growth, right? I'll try and draw this a little bit. So forgive me for my drawing skills here. So let's have a go at drawing this, right? What tends to happen when you start your business? Let's talk about revenue. So you sort of, you go on this revenue curve, which looks a little bit like this, right? You start your business in revenues and it's kind of like, you know, bumping along at the bottom when you start out as an entrepreneur, building your business. And then what happens is, is you hit that point where you start to, you know, you hit the gold vein in your business. You go, wow, we're starting to do it now. We're really working. And what then happens is your revenues sort of go, whoop, they go right up, right? You start finding out what works in your business. And the revenues go all the way up and they, they increase and they increase and they increase. And naturally what happens is, is your revenues tend to taper off. That's natural. This is kind of an S curve that many businesses will follow. Your business will follow this for sure. This is like the natural law of business. You'll spend many months at the bottom bumping along a very fast growth period and then you'll level out. And then what happens is maybe there's another growth period and you'll level out. But that tends to be how businesses grow over time. So that's your revenues. Let's su superimpose over this your costs, so your outgoing. So what tends to happen when you start out you're losing money, right? You're losing money because you're not making enough money, you're not selling enough, you're in debt, you're in, you're making a loss starting out, right? So you're, you're sort of going along like this, you're, you're losing money, you're losing money, but they get to this magical point where your business is growing and you're starting to make a profit now, you're starting to be cash positive. What's happening here is you're starting to bring money in and you're starting to make more money than you're is going out of the business and it feels good, right? So this sort of continues for a little while. And then what then happens is you start to say, well, actually, if we start hiring more people or get a PR agency or get an events company or exhibit at this, at this conference or da, 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 lots and lots of things, what happens is then you start to feel that you can spend more money now. And this happens in nine out of 10 businesses that I see is their overheads, their costs go like this. And this happens, in, as I said, so many businesses, what happens is, is that they have a, a good sales period and what follows the sales period is increasing overheads. What then happens is they start to find, they look around. I mean, this happened to me when I started my business. They look around their businesses and, you know, let's say for argument's sake, their costs are, sorry, that their income, their revenue is $10,000 a month just for argument's sake, right? And their costs now are fifteen thousand dollars a month because they look around and they've got now they've got a developer in the office and they've got a bigger office and all these kind of outgoings have just spiraled out of control. And what happens is you end up building a monster, and I see this in so many businesses, right? And they become location dependent. They end up building a monster, a cookie monster, which eats all your cookies. And this is really demotivating because what's now happening is you've got a business that has higher overheads than your sales and it's extremely demotivating as an owner of this business. What I see in, happening in many businesses is the situation where the tail wags the dog. So what now happens is the business overheads are greater than the revenues, so therefore you have to make decisions about the business which are not in the interest of growth. Like for example, you have to take on certain kinds of work just to pay the staff. Right. So you end up becoming trapped in the business and this can be extremely stressful, this situation. And it happens in so many businesses, the business owner, a stressful situation where now your 
costs have spiraled out of control. So you can't have the freedom of choice that you once had back in the day when, again, you were making a loss, but you didn't have high overheads starting out. And what then happens is you become demotivated. You become demotivated because there's nothing more demotivating than having a situation, for example, where the first $50,000 of your sales every month goes to paying your staff, right? Because you know, as a business owner, you get paid last, right? You get paid last. You know, as $50,000 have cleared, then you can get paid. But you've got to do 50000 just to get to that point. And it's extremely demotivating. You have this monster that's just consuming all your energy and all your revenues. And the worst part about, absolutely worst part about this is you have to take on board work which you don't want to do. I see so many entrepreneurs working for clients that they don't want to work for just because their client pays the bills. And this is what I call a location dependent business. They end up doing the kind of low value work. The clients just tell them what to do. They don't end up doing the kind of work that they set out wanting to do at the beginning. So let's talk about organic growth. How do you build a business that creates organic growth? The opposite of this. Well, it kind of looks a little bit like this. Let's start out with your, your overhead, sorry, with your, your sales first, right? So you're, again, you're bumping along sales at the beginning. And then what happens is, is you have this sort of slow upswing of revenues. And superimpose your overheads over that. Again, you're losing money at the beginning of the business. And then you get to this magical break even point here. You can see that where you start to make a profit. But the key here, is you don't change anything. You maintain the business and its location independence throughout. And what happens now is you have this magical area where you're cash positive, okay? What then happens if your sales slows down, you're not in a situation where you can't afford to pay your sales guy or a PR manager, right? Because you don't have a sales guy or a PR manager. You end up having a lot of daylight in your business, which gives you a lot of breathing space, which is great for making decisions. So let's have a look at what makes you location independent. What's the key here to being successful in this model? Um, location dependence, sorry, the flipping on the head. Let's have a look at the, what is the mistake that entrepreneurs make when growing a business. And we'll flip that on its head to look at the opposite of that. So the key here is ego. And this kills so many businesses, corporate ego. So growing a business to impress other people. And probably the biggest thing that, people do and the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make here is getting a, a cool office. You don't need an office. Nine out of 10 entrepreneurs that I work with don't need offices. Very rarely does somebody need an office these days. If you have an office, not only do you have a space which you have to commute to on a daily basis, again, that's cost. You have to furnish the office. All kinds of things go in that office that cost money and time. Plus, the office itself is a commitment, right? If you get rid of the office, you can create a lot of freedom. But people think, oh, I need an office. That's a business. A business needs an office. A business doesn't need an office in this day and age, right? You can go and work in your client's office if you need to. You can use a co-working space. Avoid an office at the very last push. Take on board an office. But every opportunity avoid taking on board an office that's what i advise every single startup that i work with at the last moment get an office but until that point you don't need one work at home work in a co-working space the other thing is taking on board staff that you don't need absolutely unless your staff are making or selling don't employ them you don't need anybody in your business and then they're making widgets or selling widgets right so whatever your business, you are either making or selling stuff, right? Unless somebody's doing that, you don't need that person right now until you, you know, you're very profitable as a business. Up until that point, there are major distractions, not in terms, not just in terms of money, but if you, you're the owner of the business. You have to look after that person. You have to manage that person. You have to review that person. You have to tell that person what to do. Unless they're making or selling stuff, forget it. Don't get them on board. They'll, they will suck money out of your business and you don't need them. Avoid conferences and exhibitions. You know, this is, people think that going to conferences and exhibitions is a great way to grow your business. They're not. They're a complete distraction. 
don't bother. You know, only do conferences and exhibitions that you are running, right? Avoid everybody else's because that's a complete time suck. And avoid cool clients. Don't chase after the big names. I talk about the kind of clients you need to be focusing on to grow your business right now. But the big names are a major time suck because they can treat small companies like you as they want. So, you know, they'll have you running around for ages trying to get a deal. And you get really excited that you might get a deal with Facebook or whoever, right? But, you know, so many times these deals don't come off. So don't kid yourself. Focus on the easier clients, the low-lying fruit at this stage. So how do you become ultra lean as a business? This is the key. This is what you need to focus on. The first one is understanding your value, right? So everything that you do in a business on a daily basis is either high value or a low value task. And one of the challenges that I set the entrepreneurs that I work with is to list out all their tasks in business and find the low value tasks and outsource them. So in business, you may be familiar with the 80-20 rule. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But basically what it means is that some of the stuff you do is very productive, but most of what you do isn't productive, right? There's one day in a week or one meeting or one phone call that you have that creates more value than everything else in your business in a week. Everything else is just fluff. So how do you focus on that high value stuff and less on that low value stuff? Let's have a look at that. What I want to do is set you a challenge. Let's list out all the things that we do as entrepreneurs, so me and you do as entrepreneurs on a daily basis, right? And then we'll split these up. And we'll look at which one of these are high value and which one of these are low value tasks, right? And we'll split these out into a quadrant because this is a great tool that you can use to manage your time. So let's have a look. In the chat box, what I want you to do is list out what are the things that you do as an entrepreneur on a daily basis. Everything, like for example, designing websites, phoning clients. Let's start writing these down now because what I do is I collect these and I put these into a quadrant. So this is our list of tasks, right? So I'll start it off, right? So for example, in the chat box here, designing websites or uh, calling clients, what other kind of things do you as entrepreneurs do on a daily basis? Let's have a think. What other kind of things do startup founders do on a daily basis? Just chuck anything in there and what we'll do as a, a team is we'll start organizing these, right? And I'll show you, this is a really powerful tool, I'll show you how you take that list and you'll insert it into one of these quadrants and you'll know from that list which quadrant you need to be focusing on, right? So what else do we have? So designing websites, calling clients, dealing with non-paying clients. That's a great one. That's such a time suck as well, but great one. Checking emails. Oh boy, how much time in the day do we spend checking emails, right? Probably far too much. What do we do during a day? So designing websites, calling clients, dealing with non-paying clients, checking emails. Just Chuck all our ideas down in here and we'll start writing these out. Okay. okay, so you write them in there and I'll start chucking these into the quadrant up here. So uh, designing websites, calling clients. Right, in here, clients, calling clients. So just keep coming forward with your ideas. Keep chucking them in there. Calling clients. What else do we have? Creating business plans. Excellent. Planning. All right, checking emails. Check emails. All right, we're gonna put that one in there. What else do we have? Dealing with non-paying non-paying clients. All right. What else do we have? Uh, meetings, client meetings. All right, making posters for marketing. Uh, marketing. All right. Okay. Managing social media. Very good. Cool. What else do we have? Uh, I'm very hot in here. It's very hot here tonight in Japan. So anyway, all right. Okay. Uh, what do we have? Client meetings, planning, calling clients. All right. So I split these up. So basically, if you take your list of all the things that you do on a daily basis, and I, I recommend that you do this afterwards, and you split this list up, 
and put it into the quadrant according to is it important or is it unimportant? Is it urgent or is it non-urgent? What tends to happen is that most of your activities end up here. Most of what you do on a daily basis is important and urgent, right? Like checking emails, responding to people, doing stuff that needs to be done yesterday, all that kind of thing. That's the, the typical situation of an entrepreneur or a startup founder, right? But most of what makes the money in your business, what creates good growth in your business, exists here, right? So do you see this kind of difference, right? There's a, a situation where we have, you know, we have most of what we do is in the important and urgent, low value activity, but what creates value in the business, okay? So what then happens is, is we end up growing a business around the urgent stuff, stuff that needs to be done today or very, very quickly. And we never ever have time to do what's really important in our business and the stuff that goes in here in this quadrant. So the key here is go through your list, start separating, separating out what you do on a daily basis and work out, this is the challenge, work out how you can take some of this stuff I've circled here yellow and outsource it. Because what you then do the less that you do in there, the more time that you have in here, all right? And that alone, just doing that, is probably one of the most profound tests or profound tools that you can use to discern what type of activities you'd be doing more or less of in your business. And this helps you differentiate between good and bad growth. So I recommend you try this after this webinar, do it tomorrow or whatever, do it today. Build this quadrant. As I said, at the end of this presentation, you get access to this webinar so you can learn how to do it again. Okay. All right. So that was the time quadrant. The second thing to key to location independence and building a lean business is this many small wins. Okay. Now, what tends to happen in business, and I see this a lot with entrepreneurs starting out, is they have a sales pipeline that looks a little bit like this. So they're going along with not much sale and then boom, big client. Going along, boom, big client. Going along, going along, boom, big client. You know what I mean? This is what I call a lumpy sales pipeline. What happens is, is that you have a pipeline or, you know, what I mean by pipeline is money into your business. You have a pipeline where it's either feast, so you're eating like crazy, or famine, where you're starving, right? And this is very typical of early stage businesses because what they do is they focus on big clients who pay big money. And big clients who pay big money take big time to pay and to do deals. So they have big stages of nothing, client, nothing, client. This is a very difficult model to grow your business with because what happens is on top of that, you have this sort of revenue. I mean, so you have this cost overhead that goes a bit like that because every time you take on a big client you kind of increase your costs as well sometimes you take on more people and so on and what then happens is when the client disappears you then have a situation where your costs are greater than your revenues again right so it's very very difficult to build a business like that what you need to do is focus on many small wins and that will look something like this so you would have a, a sales pipeline that looks like this. So for the Japanese, let's talk about baseball. And for everybody else, cricket, maybe, or just the British, I don't know. So in, in baseball analogies, it's like home runs and stealing individual bases, if that works. So what I mean by that is problem is with starting a business, a lot of people focus on home runs, which is to knock it out of the park which is to go for the big hit, which is to go for the, the deal, which is going to make all the difference, right? Where games are won by stealing individual bases, very, very small increments, right? So what you need to do 
is you need a business where you're not focused on very, very big deals all the time because that can destroy a business. That can demotivate you as well because the client ends up dictating business terms to you because you're desperate, right, for that deal. Therefore, you can't become a location independent business. You have to stay where you are, stay with your current setup, and you can't grow the business as you want it. But if you have many small wins, which is lots and lots of small deals, you're in a much better situation because you spread the risk of every single client, every single deal across many, many numbers, right? So what you need is a business where you have multiple price levels. Let me talk about what that is. Think about your product right now. Maybe you have one product or service. Now, my challenge to you is how can you split this up so you have many price levels, right? Let's talk about what the benefit of doing that is. So most people have a product which is going to put in here, which I'll call just the main product, right? That's your main product. That's the, that's the big thing. That's what you do. And they just have that. It doesn't matter what price it is. That's their main thing. That's the thing that they do, right? That's all of their business. But what you should think about doing is you should start thinking about in increasing and decreasing the price options. So you have down here at the bottom an introductory product, okay? Now, in marketing terms, this is called a tripwire product, okay? It's a bit of a technical term. But let me explain what that means. It's a product which somebody who doesn't pay a little bit of money, could be a dollar, could be $10, to test you and your product and your experience, right? That's a tripwire product. That's an entry level. And you're not going to make any money out of a tripwire product. But, see, here's the good thing about that is that when somebody buys a tripwire product from you, they're 10 times more likely to now go and buy the main product, right? So it's kind of a loss leader. It's kind of an introductory. You don't want to give this stuff away for free because you want serious, you know, serious prospects, serious customers, people who can get their credit card out and buy your product. Because the difference between zero and one is bigger than the difference between one at ten thousand dollars, right? So that tripwire product is really important to get people at different price levels. And then on top of that, what you want is a third product or service, which we'll call a profit maximizer. All right. Now, the profit maximizer is your main product, but extended okay and you're not giving more content away you're going to give more access away rather than, let's say for example your main product was uh, an course an online course for example your profit maximizer is not going to be more content more of the course what you're going to do is give the person who buys the main product more access to you okay because that is worth a lot more money than more content what happens is, is when somebody buys the main product, again, they're 10 times more likely to buy the profit maximizer. And the profit maximizer, you can charge five to 10 times more than your main product. So your tripwire product could be a dollar, your main product could be $10, and your profit maximizer could be $100. But it's really important that you understand build these multiple price levels in to your marketing from early on and you target people rather than trying to sell the profit maximizer straight away you try and sell your tripwire product so if you're struggling now to sell maybe the problem is that you're going in at too high a level maybe you're trying to sell a profit maximizer and you can come down a little think about how could you sell a tripwire product that could be an ebook or it could be you know, a 15 minute call with you or whatever it is, there's something you can give away of very little price, but has value to that person. That person can understand that you can deliver on that value. As I said, you can get this at the end of the presentation. So there's a lot of information here. 
and key to this is productizing your offering. So a lot of people starting a business have a service. And that's great because a service is easy to produce. You don't need a product. It's you and your skills and whether or not that person trusts you. But the problem with, with any service is that it's you and your time. You We haven't quite worked out how to clone people yet, right? So you're limited by the amount of time that you have. And often you, you as the startup founder, create the most value in the business, right? You can hire people to do your job. But at the end of the day, you are the best at doing this, right? Because it's your business and you know exactly what's what. So what you should think about if you have a service is productizing your offering, which is basically how could you take your service and produce a product out of that? So let's say, for example, you have a recruitment service which is very time and people intensive. How could you create a product around that recruitment service that people could buy off the shelf whilst you're sleeping? Because if you can create a product that people can buy and consume and pay for while you're sleeping, you can grow your business, the good growth that we talked about earlier. If, for example, you only have a service and try to grow your business, then it absolutely requires you recruiting more people. And that is the exact situation that we talked about earlier, the bad growth. You know, where your business is going up like this, but then your overheads kind of overtake, if you remember, right? Because you need more people to deliver the service. And the key here, lastly, we talked about this in the other webinar, passive income. If you want to go and travel the world, you absolutely need to create a business either within your current business or outside of your business that creates passive income. And what is passive income? Passive income is money you make while you sleep. If you want to get rich, the number one rule for getting rich is to make money while you sleep. You will never get rich making money selling your time. It's impossible. You have to do it by building assets and those assets creating money whilst you sleep. We talked about in the other webinar, which you can go back and review, you can access this webinar. I'll show you the link at the end of this. Um, how to invest in real estate, how to create financial independence. All of this comes down to passive income. Because if you can create passive income in your life or in your business, then what happens is you start to get more money than you're spending on a monthly basis. And if you're making more money than you're spending on a monthly basis as you sleep, you can do what the hell you like. You can go and travel the world, do what you like, because everything is covered, right? You can do that within your business by focusing on repeat, subscribe. So the absolute key here, good growth versus bad growth. If you want to focus on good growth, one, of my, one piece of advice that I want to give you now is how can you take your current business and turn those customers into subscribers, right? You know, you look at one of the most successful businesses in the world right now, telecoms. You know, everybody has one of these, right? And everybody who has one of these is paying money every month to the mobile phone companies. And it's the easiest business in the world. And one of the most profitable because it's repeat subscribers. And you can do too. So rather than focus on one-off transactions, one-off transactions are very expensive. There's a lot of hidden cost in servicing one-off transactions. Once you focus on getting that person on board and paying ideally a monthly subscription to your service, you can grow your business. There's so many reasons why that is good for your business. I can't go into all of them right now, but one reason that you can think about now is if you have a subscriber base, people paying regular amounts every month, then what you can then do is you can forecast your business. So you know next month roughly how much money you're going to get next month. So therefore, you know what you can spend money on and what you can't spend money on. And if you go back to before, all the problems associated with growing a business usually come from having a business that goes kind of up and down like this, as every startup does, right? But if you can move that from lumpy into subscriptions, then you get into a situation where you can really grow your business because then you can focus on retaining customers and once you focus on retaining customers, you really are in growth mode. If you're constantly focused on winning customers, it's very difficult to grow your business. What you've got to do, you know, you're, think of your business as a bucket where you're putting water into the bucket. Chances are 
and I see this in most entrepreneurs starting out, they're simply, you know, they have a bucket with many, many holes in it, and they've got a fire hose, a fire hose, right, and they're shooting water into this bucket really, really fast, lots and lots of water, and it's just coming out of the bucket, right? But what you've got to do is if you can close all the holes in the bucket, you know, you don't need a fire hose. You just need a, a very small tap. A few drips will fill that bucket eventually, right? And that creates a very, very different mindset, a very, very different attitude towards business, a lot less stressful, believe me, right? Okay, um, I'll skip this slide because we don't have time to talk about the two-step strategy. That was in the last uh, webinar about financial independence, if you're interested. I'll just give you a very brief description. This is how... I became financially independent. This is how you could become financially independent, you know, and go and travel the world very, very quickly. You know, I'm going to give you 12 years of experience in about 12 seconds. So forgive me if I leave out a lot. It's basically simple like this, right? You know, create a lifestyle business that generates cash. Okay. A lifestyle business is something that you enjoy. You wake up and you love doing it. You're not building this business to sell it. You're building this business because you want to do it, right? The goal of the business is not to sell it, but the goal of the business is to keep playing the game, right? And create cash. And then what you do is you build a second business, which is an investment business, which you use to acquire assets that create an income. So that's meant to be a house, by the way. It's like a three-year-old drawing. <laughs> I'm sorry if you've got a three-year-old child and they can do a better job of my job just now, but hey, you get the point, right? Um, what you then do is you take all the excess cash from your lifestyle business and you invest it into an investment business. And as I said, I talked about that in the other webinar. That's what you do. That is the surefire way of becoming financially independent. Okay, it may take you five, seven, ten years, but it works, right? So that is how one of the ways you become financially independent by coming financially independent, creating passive income. You can then go off and travel the world. So as I said, that's twelve seconds for twelve years of experience. Um, key to this then is you know building a location independent business. I think probably the most important you can think about doing is surround yourself with good people. Because what happens is, is that you know, in growing any kind of business, the people you regularly expose yourself to or are exposed to will impact you below, way beyond the credit you give them for, right? So if you surround yourself with people who are ambitious or who don't believe that you can build a location independent business, whatever it is, then they will impact your thoughts and your expectations about your business. So it's so important to surround yourself with people who A, get it, and B, have done it already, or are planning on doing it. Because if you surround yourself with these people, they will lift you up. They will change and challenge your assumptions. They will give you insights into how you can do this, right? And that's why I built the UpSchool Mastermind, which we're currently beta testing, but we plan to go live in two weeks. So if you're interested in that, then let me know. You know, if you want to be part of an entrepreneurial community where you can network and share knowledge with like-minded entrepreneurs, people who want to grow location-independent businesses, or people who just want to help other entrepreneurs for the hell of it because they are passionate about business. That's coming soon. So I just thought I'd plug that now because nothing to sell at the moment, just to tell you about the idea. So before we go to the QA, so so much information tonight. That was 40. 45 minutes of information, absolutely packed. I tell you, if you stick around to the end, I will give you the link where you can download all this stuff or get access to it, right? Um, let's talk about next week. One of the books I mentioned tonight, which I uh, absolutely recommend, is The Seven Day Startup by Dan Norris. We're going to talk about that next week. Um, if you go here, you can uh, go to our school website and under the complete webinar schedule, which you'll get a link at the end here. How to launch your business in seven days. We're going to talk about how you can do this, right? And, you know, keeping it lean enough that you can launch a business in seven days. My challenge to you is this. If you're taking more than seven days, you're taking too long, right? 
you know, I'm not talking about seven weeks or seven months, seven days, right? You can get up and running and start your business in seven days. I'm not talking about registering a business or setting up a website. I'm talking about actually getting into business and finding your first customer. Because here's the thing, right? If you don't have a paying customer, you don't have a business yet. That's the key. So our focus here in next week's webinar is the number one goal in business that every startup founder and entrepreneur should focus on, and that's this. Find your first paying customer. That's it, everything else is secondary to that, right? Find your first paying customer. That's what we're gonna talk about next week, how to do that, right? We talk about hacks, tips, tricks, and so on. Find your first paying customer, even if that first paying customer is paying you $1. You're in the game. If you get $1 from somebody, you are in the game. I don't care if your final product costs $10,000. But if you can get $1 from somebody, as I said to you earlier, the difference between zero and $1 is far bigger than the difference between one and $10,000, okay? So the challenge is to find that first paying customer. We'll talk about that next week. So here's the link to next week's webinar. That's gonna pop up at the end as well, so you don't need to write that down, just so you're aware of that. And just before we go to the Q&A, if you want to get access to today's uh, webinar, shoot me an email, graham at upschool.io, right? Shoot me an email. Just uh, send me an email. It'd be great if you tell me a little bit about your business and your current situation. I know a number of you send me emails every week. That's fantastic. I really love getting your emails. I really enjoy getting your emails and your feedback. And you know, just give me an update where you are since the last webinar, right? Just tell me how things progressed and so on. If it's your first email, just give me some background about your business, what you're starting on and so on, challenges you're facing. Shoot me an email on this and what I'll do is I'll send you back a PDF copy of the presentation tonight so you've got a review. You'll also get a link from me um, in a day or so giving you access to the video. So if you want to review, get access to the video, you'll get that as well. Shoot me an email here. So just before we go to uh, Q&A, just for those of you that missed the Q&A uh, announcement at the early on, chat box at the bottom. If you want to ask a question, pop it in there. I'll do my best. So let's go to the Q&A now. We've got about we've got a few minutes, so let's do this. All right, I'm going to read these out. Okay, so um, telecom smartphone business is easy to start, but the problem is that it's easy for very, very new developers, and as a result, competition is huge. At the same time, I'm having a problem. How to apply your advices to non-IT projects? How can you be location independent if you sell real things, hardware devices? For example, great question then in Japan. Thank you very much for your question and such a great question as well. Easy if you sell, um, you know, if you, if you sell you know, IT services or you sell digital goods, but what about if you sell physical products? Well, um, the key to this is that even if you sell a physical product, you don't have to store or produce that product yourself. As some people have already said here now, it's absolutely right. You can use services that exist to basically look after the whole process for you. So you don't even need to touch that physical product to distribute it. You know, one of the biggest challenges of having a physical product is you are, need to be in a physical location, right? But now you can use drop shipping uh, operations. I'll put a light in here just so you know what I'm talking to. You can check it out later on. So check out drop shipping. Drop shipping is basically where you can take a physical product. You can have your manufacturer ship the physical product to a drop shipping warehouse, and you have companies who specialize in taking all the physical goods from all over the place and then distributing these physical goods anywhere in the world. And you know, even Amazon does this now, as Akos says as well. Amazon FBA, Amazon fulfilled by Amazon. You can have Amazon sell your physical products. I don't know what your physical product is. Um, may be able to sell it on Amazon. Maybe you don't want to sell it on Amazon. But the point is that you can have a trusted brand name like Amazon looking after the whole process for you. So let's say you had a physical product which was, or let's say, for example, you're producing I don't know, smartphones, as an example, right? Or smartphone cases, that's a great example. Let's say you're producing smartphone cases, right? You get those manufactured in China, or even Japan, right? and then you get the manufacturer to send them to Amazon. Amazon will warehouse these products. When somebody buys the product, 
they get in the email is sent via Amazon to you. You obviously, you know, you fulfill that order. So you say yes, okay, send that order. That then goes back to Amazon, and Amazon warehouse will ship that product to the person who buys the product, right? You don't touch the product at all. All you do is you deal with the customer service and the marketing, which is absolutely the most valuable part of any business. Right? So what's happening now is there's so many manufacturers who are outsourcing their physical manufacturing process and focusing only on customer service distribution and marketing, which is the high value stuff, right? So that's how you can deal with a physical product. I don't know your product. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about it, but you know that would be my answer to that. And there are many examples of companies doing this right now. Start having looking um, look on the internet under drop shipping as a starting point. I don't know how popular this is now in Japan, but you know there are many many entrepreneurs working this business model. And interestingly, you know the uh, these entrepreneurs are living in Thailand or Indonesia or Bali or wherever. They're all over the place, right? I know one example of an entrepreneur who he uh, lives in Vietnam. He gets furniture made in America, sorry, made in China, sorry. And the furniture is, you know, large items of furniture shipped from China to America where it's sold to American consumers. He lives in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, right? Doesn't touch the product whatsoever. And that's furniture, not digital products, not hardware, software, whatever. Old fashioned furniture, so it absolutely works. Hopefully that answers your question. At least, at least gives you an idea. But start having a look at drop shipping, start having a look at Amazon FBA as a good starting point. Across, any thoughts on membership site or business model? Yeah. Um, what do you want to know about a membership site business model, Akos? What can I tell you? As a, you know, what about it? You know, where should you start? What do you want to know about it? Tell me a little bit more about that. Um, I'll answer Matt's question if you don't mind. We'll come back to yours in a minute. How do we get regular clients? Um, yeah, I mean, regular clients are only clients who repeat business with you, right? So the key here is that the tips for that are. Um, you know, you need to focus on the customer service as a key marketing tool because if you can look after your clients, if you can, uh, you know, talk to them, find out what works, what doesn't work, then they will more likely repeat business with you, more likely to refer, you know, bring you new customers and so on. So. One of the pieces of advice I give to entrepreneurs that I work with is focus on your existing clients more than new customers. Focus on your existing clients. Direct your marketing to existing clients. Even if you have one client, you can start there because it's better to look after that one client and get that one client to refer new customers to you than to constantly try and find new clients, right? So tips is really where do you focus your time? Focus your time on existing clients, existing customers, and build a dialogue with them. And a dialogue really means, you know, go and if you have a client, go and meet the client. Go and have coffee or a beer with the client. Go and have lunch with that client. You know, build a human relationship with your clients. You can't do this with thousands, but when you're starting out, maybe you have five clients, maybe you have, you know, whatever, one client. That's the best way. Go and have a beer. Or a coffee or a lunch or noodles with your client and talk to them because they will give you so much insight that you won't get from email you won't get from on the phone you won't get from filling out a form you know when you sit with a client and your client tells you about the problems that they have in business and what they're trying to do there's an emotional connection which really enhances your business relationship with the client you know that's the what we say in business is empathy, where you can really understand the client's problem from their perspective and their eye. And that is the most powerful way to get regular clients. Because a regular client is just a client who buys again and again and again, right? Of course, there's ways you can set that up in your business to have regular clients, you know, with a subscription model or so on. But that's how you're going to do it. 
go in, build a relationship with your client, understand your client, learn about your client, you know, become passionate about your client, and then what you can then do is build a business around them. Hopefully that answers your question, but maybe there's a lot more to it on the technical side, which maybe you can go into if you ask a follow-up question. Uh, Akos, okay, to your question about membership site business models. Do I like or dislike it? it it's a kind of subscription model, as you mentioned. However, you have to take care of your members month after month. On the other hand, it needs quite a lot of work before launching. So membership business model, absolutely. I think membership business models are really good business models to build because um, for two reasons. Firstly, subscription model. So, you know, if somebody pays $10 a month, you know, they're more likely to pay $120 in a year than somebody paying $120 in one go, right? I mean, that's why you see when you sign up for these services that everything's geared towards paying monthly because they know once you pay, you're more likely to stay, you know, because we human beings, we don't like change, right? So once you're in, it's great. So that's the easy part. The second part why I love membership models is uh, you get some great feedback, right? Let's say you have 10 members in one month and then the next month five members stop renewing. They stop their subscription. You know immediately something is wrong, okay? And you can act like that. So a lot of membership-based business models focus on churn. I'll just write it in here because this is a technical term that marketers use, churn, right? Um, so for example, go back to this. If you take this as a subscription model, the mobile business, right? Mobile operators can always focus on churn. Churn means how many subscribers do they lose every month, right? And there is a direct link between churn and profit. It's the most insightful number that tells you how profitable that business is. More than revenues, more than subscriber numbers, more than new subscribers, whatever. Churn is the most important number. And membership-based models give you churn rates. So my example, again, 10 subscribers, half leave, that's a 50% churn rate, which is very, very high. So if you have a number in business, you end up focusing on that number. So if you have a membership model business, you can focus on churn rates and reducing churn. So the challenge of a membership-based business is to reduce churn. And that's why I love membership-based business models, because it's completely focused on churn reduction, which is how do we keep people in this business? How do we make them happy so they stay, right? And you get immediate feedback month after month. If people just buy once, very difficult to get feedback. People stop using it, you know, people forget, all that kind of stuff. Right? So there's two reasons why I love membership business models. Hopefully that helps. Let me know what you think. If you're starting one yourself, of course, let me know. Um, Kanti, uh, I'm just starting a web and apps and travel and tourism business like TripAdvisor, but a little bit different from them. Which best marketing agency to launch my web and apps with budget concern? Thank you. Sorry, I didn't really get your question. Are you are you concerned about uh, what's your question here? Which best? Who is the best? Oh, sorry. Which is the best marketing strategy? Sorry. Which is the best marketing strategy to launch my web and apps business with minimum budget? Okay. Welcome to the world of startups. Same for everybody. You know, everybody how to launch the business with minimum uh, budget. My advice to you: without knowing much about your business, but based on what I see in other businesses, my advice to you is. Find your fans, okay? So you are growing a web and apps business in travel and tourism. Therefore, you must know some people in travel and tourism. Find your fans in this ecosystem. So who are the 10 or 100 people in this industry that you can approach in travel and tourism who love what you do? who need what you do. Start with these people and build your business with them, right? Find your fans and build your business around your fans, right? Go slow. Don't try and get millions and millions of people 
straight away. Start with a small number and grow with your fans because your fans will give you some great feedback. They'll give you some great insight into how to grow your business and they will recommend and refer you to other people. And fans recommend to fans to their fans and so on and so on. So your, your business will grow that way. So that's without knowing much about your business, Canty, I'd say your best way starting out is your fans. And how do you find fans? Well, the best way to find fans is start with people you know. Start with people with a shared passion, a shared interest in travel and tourism like you. Approach them. Maybe you can get them to pay to use your web and apps business, even just $1. And we talked about, if you missed last week's, uh, two weeks ago presentation, we talked about the 10 by 10, 10 by 10 hack, the 10 by 10 strategy. Find 10 people to pay $10 for your web and apps business, right? Have a look at the previous webinars for how, you know, what that's about. But go out and find 10 people or 100 people to test and pay money, $1 or $10 for your business. Start with these fans, build your business with them because they will do so much for your business that you'll miss if you go out and try and find lots of customers that you don't know. Hopefully that helps, Kanti. And hopefully that was a good session for everybody. Hopefully you enjoyed that. We did an hour on the nail. Yeah, an hour. We're just a minute or so over, but that was fantastic. Great questions. Thank you so much for joining tonight. Um, there will be a, another webinar next week, how to launch your business in seven days. Go and sign up for that. We've got limited places for that webinar. Go and register. Get your name on that list. How to launch your business in seven days. That's going to be a really interesting session. So go ahead and do that before we run out of spaces. And also, yeah, look forward to seeing you next week. Same kind of questions. Send me an email if you want to get a copy of the presentation. I won't respond straight away. Um, just sort everything out, pack this up. I won't respond straight away, but I'll get back to you by tomorrow morning with the presentation deck as well. I'll send you an email where you can access the video and do all that. And see you soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Fantastic questions. Thank you so much for making this a awesome UpSchool webinar. See you next week.